Hello and welcome again to Kit Plus TV. Today's guest needs little introduction. He's an award-winning producer, director, editor, teacher and trainer who's been involved in the media industry for 50 years. He's produced, directed and edited at local broadcast TV stations and network television in the US and created more corporate videos than he can count. And he's even been on, t on tour with us on the Kit Plus show around the UK giving inspirational seminar sessions. Yeah, so without further ado, we'd like to welcome Larry Jordan to the studio. Hello, Larry. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, it is always my pleasure, Matt and Simon. Thank you so much for a wonderful introduction. I'm sure I don't deserve those remarks, but it makes me blush every time I hear them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. So, Larry, most of us know that Apple announced its long-awaited Apple Silicon computers uh, very recently. What does it actually mean, and what's your take on it? <laughs> It's really exciting news. I mean, if you think about it, Apple has released its own chip for the fourth. I mean, it's, it's, it's going through an architecture change for the fourth time. When they first began, they were working with Motorola chips, the 68,000. Then they did an architecture change and went to the PC, power PC. And that lasted for about eight years. Then they did an architecture change and went to the Intel chip, which lasted for 14 years. And now they're doing it for the fourth time. And if you think about it, no other computer company has ever gone through a single architecture change and Apple's doing it for the fourth time. So I am very optimistic that the shift to Apple Silicon is doing great things for the future. But there's still a whole lot that we don't know. But am I excited? I'm completely excited. It's just, this is a, a wonderful time to be in the computing industry. So, so the Apple M1 chip is at the heart of all these new devices. What makes this CPU different from previous CPUs that Apple have been using? The word CPU, and that's a really good question because we think of the M1 as the CPU, but it's actually what's called an SOC, a silicon on a system on chip. Inside this one little wafer is a CPU, is the GPU, the graphics processing unit. It's what's called a neural engine, which is optimized for artificial intelligence or machine learning. It has its own integrated uh, RAM memory so that everything is in this one chip as opposed to having to have a whole flock of chips. The advantages of this are one, less heat, two, more performance, three, smaller size, which means that it is optimized for mobile devices. And the other cool thing, and we'll talk more about this in just a couple of minutes, is the power this has. The, the, if this is the entry level benchmark, the power that this line of chips has is phenomenal. The potential is, is mind-blowing. So, Larry, you, you, you mentioned that keyword performance zone. You know, after all, that's what people upgrade for. What is the performance like with this, with this new um, M1 chip? Well, you realize that the M1 has not shipped. Apparently, according to what I read just before I went on the air with you, Apple has released for shipment but has not yet arrived in any customer hands the new MacBook Air, which is one of the three computers that Apple announced. So nobody knows how fast this chip is except Apple. So given that, what is the chip derived from? Well, Apple has been creating its own system on chip since the A7 for the iPhone, the A7, the A8. And the most recent iPhone chip is the A14. Anantech, which is a, a technology website, which is known for its analysis of CPUs, has done some testing on the A14, which is available, and extrapolating from that into what the M1 provides. Based upon what Anantech showed, it shows that the M1 chip is faster than any existing Macintosh computer, sorry, Macintosh laptop computer, and faster than almost all Macintosh computers. And this is out of the box. I'll give you an example. And then there's, there's ways of measuring CPU performance, different from GPU and others, but CPU performance is measured in single core and multi core speeds. The 16 inch i9 Intel MacBook has a score of 1067. The M1 has a single core score of 1687, 60% faster. If we look at multi-core, a multi-core i9 has a, a benchmark score of 6870. The multi-core score of the M1, which is the entry-level chip, has a multi-core score, multi-core score of 7400. 
this this single little itty bitty chip, which right now is designed for the MacBook Air, blows the doors off the 16 inch Intel MacBook, which is just a, a phenomenal statement. So the performance is through the roof. So if you're reporting that the CPU or the SOC is, is that much faster, this this many times faster, what about the, and it's all a part of it, the GPU, battery life, general performance of the whole system? Well, this gets, I think, to a much bigger question. We have to ask, who is this chip designed for? What are these computers designed for? And is it important yeah. for us to consider the computer that was released? And the answer is yes to all of the above. This CPU, this, this system on a chip, the M1, was designed for low heat, was designed for reasonable performance, and reasonable we can argue about for years, and it was designed for, um, hang on, I gotta look at my note, it was low heat and good performance and longer battery life which means that it's designed for computers which are portable, laptops, which is why it came out in the Air and the MacBook Pro, because these are computers that need low heat, need mobility, long battery life. But if you think about what the Mac Pro is or an iMac, they're plugged into power all the time, which means that heat is not an issue because we can build fans in to cool them. And uh, battery life is not important because they aren't on a battery. So the M1 is optimized for for mobile devices, the way that whatever follows the M1, the M2, or the A, or the X, or whatever Apple's gonna call it, is gonna be optimized for less thermal restriction, means it can run hotter, greater cooling, higher performance, and now Apple can really start to focus on creating what's called a discrete GPU. Rather than putting the GPU in the same chip with the, the CPU, by having two separate chips, you can optimize the CPU for CPU work and the, optimize the GPU for GPU work. Basically, what this means is, if you're somebody that wants a mobile computer that blows the doors off other mobile computers, the M1 is the right chip. If you're a video editor, a professional that, that edits video or media or audio, but works with massive amounts of files, this is the right chip family, but these are the not, not the right computers. We need to wait a bit. Remember, Apple said the transition is going to take two years. The iMac is not on the list, mm. the Mac Pro is not on the list, and these are the workhorses of the media industry. So what we need to do is to say, this is incredible. I am so excited, but I'm not buying these computers yet for media work. For business work, they're phenomenal. For portable work, they're phenomenal. For students, they're phenomenal. But for media professionals, there's more and better stuff coming. So there's three computers um, in this lineup um, I believe, Larry. Um, and one of the observations straight away has been Thunderbolt 3. Why not Thunderbolt 4? <laughs> I have become much more knowledgeable about Thunderbolt 4 over the last two months. The, it, it depends. If you're wearing a Windows hat, Thunderbolt 4 is phenomenal. If you're wearing a Macintosh hat, Thunderbolt 4 is not worth getting out of bed for. And the reason is, on the Mac, Apple has implemented every possible spec within Thunderbolt 3 that can be implemented. And Thunderbolt 4 is exactly the same as Thunderbolt 3, with the exception of A, a cabling standard, and B, the ability to hub Thunderbolt ports. That's the only difference between three and four. There's no speed difference, there's no performance difference, there's no monitor difference, it's the same thing. On the PC, the standards have been much more lax. PC says it's got Thunderbolt 3, but maybe it runs at Thunderbolt 2 or Thunderbolt 1 speeds, so or it doesn't drive the monitor to the same resolution. And cabling for Thunderbolt is a complete nightmare. You plug a Thunderbolt cable in, it's anybody's guess what performance you're going to get out of it, especially if you're running that cable over a USB network as opposed to Thunderbolt network. There's no cabling standard. So the big advantage for the PC is that when a PC manufacturer says it's Thunderbolt 4 compatible, you get actual Thunderbolt 4 speeds rather than an allusion to. You get Thunderbolt cables that are capable of carrying the data at the correct rate. You get cables that are capable of carrying power, most can't. You get cables which are longer. You can only do a 0.8 meter right now. Now you can go up to two meters with Thunderbolt 4. So for PC people, Thunderbolt is dancing on the table time. 
For Macintosh people, Thunderbolt 4 is okay, great. Maybe it's fine, maybe it isn't, but you're not gonna see any difference with the exception, and it's a reasonable one, of being able to hub a Thunderbolt port. So you could take a single Thunderbolt and split it into four different devices at the mm. same time. That requires Thunderbolt 4. My guess is, is that Apple decided, and I don't know, uh, my guess is that Apple decided that given the time that they needed to release the computers by the end of the year, because that was their promise, given the logistics of the pandemic, which have affected all of us, and given what these computers are going to be used for, support for Thunderbolt 4 is not necessary. When we move into the power components, which will be next year, which is what Apple has told us, then I fully expect Thunderbolt 4 to be implemented across the Mac because Apple has always been on the leading edge of any technology that it can be. My guess is the timing and the pandemic and getting everything to work worked in a normal situation. It would probably have supported Thunderbolt 4, but it's not really a lack that it doesn't because we're not going to see any performance difference because on the Mac, the specs were implemented with Thunderbolt 3. Thanks, Larry. So the annual presentation is always packed with new releases, but did anything strike you as particularly unusual this time on this Apple event? Yes, what a great question that is. And the answer is Apple didn't talk about software. There wasn't a single software package that was mentioned, or if it was mentioned, it was only tangential. There was, yes, the reference that Final Cut can render faster or Logic can do this, but it was there was no software focus. It was exclusively focused mm -hmm on hardware, which I found is very interesting because the reason Apple generally showcases software is to provide a reason to buy the hardware. As you know, that's that's the reason we, we don't buy a computer to use as a doorstop, we buy a computer to run the software. But there was no software focus. And if you think about it, what is Apple trying to do? They're trying to convince every developer, including all those at Apple, to create programs that run on Apple Silicon. So I think by highlighting the hardware, they're using this as an incentive to encourage developers to support the new hardware. And given the reaction that I'm reading, I think everybody is in favor of it. With, with one exception, one exception, I, I, was, I was struck. I was struck by the comments from people saying, you know, it's the same form factor. It's the same design. It's the same aluminum. Oh, woe is me. Life is over because, we, and I, I had to think about this for a second. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but I suddenly realized that the reason people were complaining is not because we buy computers because of how they look, but they're missing bragging rights. They want the bragging right to say they're holding an M1 chip. And if the computer looks the same, they've got nothing to brag about. They've got to show you the computer and say, oh, by the way, it's an, it's an M1. You should be proud of me for getting this. So they're, they're upset because they can't show how smart they are by buying the latest technology. I just I just was struck by that common human failing of wanting to brag about having the latest toys. And, yeah, yeah. Do, you think, <laughs> and, and do you think that's what's leading, Larry, on the web to people already complaining about the design choices that Apple have made on these devices? Oh yeah, I mean, I wanna, I wanna have everybody know that I've got the latest technology. When was the last time, Matt, that you went to the computer store and said, I have to have a computer that's got quarter inch bezels or I'm not gonna buy it? I mean, just think about that. And and the bezels had darn well better be non-reflective black or the computer is useless. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you went to the computer store and said, if it doesn't have a stand that fits in less than 2.75 square, whatever measurement they use in Europe, yeah. square thingies, then yeah. I'm not gonna, wrong. These are just people that that want something to say. I've got the latest and greatest. Uh, I the last yeah. I'm, I've it's just try it, anyway. People have to complain. Might so, as well complain about something stupid. Yeah. So given this this transition to Apple Silicon, and uh, okay, if someone's got over the fact that they're happy to go for the new technology and not just bragging rights or something shiny and dazzly and new, what advice have you got for specifically for our audience for media creators? considering whether or not to, to to invest? Are they going to buy the new gear or not? Well, I think there's several answers to this. And the other big piece of news that happened this morning, and I should probably mention we're recording this and, and things change over time, but this morning, just before mm. you and I started talking, Apple released Big Sur. Big Sur is the new significant upgrade to the Macintosh operating system, so significant that it's no longer called OS X, 
it's now OS 11. So they've done a sea change in terms of, of what marked not just by Apple Silicon, but with the operating system itself. The, right. um, the release of Big Sur is significant. It's going to be profound. It's, we're going to be living with it for the next 10 years, the same way we lived with OS 10 for 10 years. We're going to be living with Big Sur for a long time to come. My strong recommendation is don't upgrade. Upgrade any system you have for testing, that's fine, but don't upgrade any production systems until we get to a dot one release. Operating systems are huge, they're complex, and we're doing mission critical work. So the number one thing you don't want to do is don't rush into a new version of the operating system when you're trying to meet deadlines. I've got several computers here in the office, and I'll have one that I'll upgrade to Big Sur almost immediately, so I need to be able to do training on it and provide help to people that ask. But I'm not upgrading my production system. I can't afford the risk. So I, I always urge people to be cautious in upgrading to the operating system until there's a dot one release. With that said, let's look at what these three computers are. These three computers are brand new. They are extremely exciting. They have huge potential and they're untested. I would not recommend getting the MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air for production work because that's not what they're designed for. They're designed for other things. They're designed for education. They're designed for business. They're designed for mobility. They're designed for consumers. They're designed for lots of different folks but their primary audience is not media professionals. And I include video editors and audio editors and motion graphic designers, and maybe even Photoshop I would include in that as well. People that need the most performance out of their computer. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not severely tempted to buy a MacBook Air just for the sheer joy of having one. I think it's a delightful system, but I'm not gonna put it into my production process. If you do wanna have a computer to do for production, one of the things that's gone away is the choice between an Intel i3 and an i5, an i7, and an i9. There's now just the M1. So we have a single unified CPU. We also have a unified GPU with this computer. But you do want to get as much RAM as you can afford, at least 16 gig, it makes a difference. And I would opt, I would opt for the mid-range SSD. So if you're getting a computer, get something that's not the biggest storage because you're always going to need external storage and don't get the smallest get something in the middle so one i think the new machines are very exciting but they're not targeted at media professionals better stuff is coming two if you're getting a machine spend your money getting ram and spend your money with medium amounts of storage the middle of the range but always as much ram as possible unlike past systems including the mac mini we cannot upgrade the ram on these systems so you have to buy it. You have to put in the RAM you need at the time you buy it. Upgrades are not possible. Also, these new systems don't support eGPUs. So you're going to have to work with the GPU that's built into the, the computer that you get. Right. So optimize RAM, optimize for storage. Know that you're going to need external storage. And by the way, the Thunderbolt port that's on the back of all these systems supports Thunderbolt 3 and 2 and 1. You'll need an adapter cable for two and one, but nonetheless, older storage will still work. So just you need to think about what's the what's the reason I'm getting this system? If the reason I'm getting the system is production, I'd hold off. If the reason you're getting the system is to experiment with the new technology, I'd buy it yesterday. If it's for personal use, the MacBook Air is a delightful machine. Yeah, that's a, that's a good place to uh, to yeah. almost end there, Larry. Apart from, I've got to ask you what else you've been working on recently. I think you had a bit of a project going on this year. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you'd ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> as, as some of you may have noticed, we're suffering through both a pandemic and, and a, a chance to stay home and rediscover our family. And uh, my family said, thank you, but we've seen enough of you. Go do something. So I wrote a book. And the book is called The Techniques of Visual Persuasion. And what, I, what it is, is it's a book about the visual arts, how we use, uh, no one reads anymore. If you think about it, with this podcast, Simon, mm. there's no reason for us to be staring at each other's incredibly handsome faces. We could easily do this as audio because there's no mm. visual information except us nodding our heads and listening. But somehow it's important for us to see each other. And the reason is, is that visuals 
are how we communicate today. We don't read, not nearly as much as we used to. We listen to podcasts, but when we're given the choice, we'd much prefer to see pictures, whether it's memes or silly animation on YouTube, or whether it's, it's stuff that's on, on Kit Plus, we need to see pictures. And this is even truer of people who are non-professionals. The, the hunger and the, the driving need to communicate visually is growing exponentially. So I put a book together for people who are not professionals called The Techniques of Visual Persuasion. And in one book, we cover persuasive writing, persuasive colors, the use of fonts, sort of setting a foundation, what is persuasion. Then I devote a section of the book to photography, Photoshop, presentations, how to do a PowerPoint presentation that doesn't kill your audience. So I've got a whole section on still images. Then I've got a section on moving images. How do you do an interview? How do you define what questions to ask? How do you shoot video? How do you edit video? How do you create motion graphics? Not because I want to turn the world into filmmakers, but the world is turning to visuals, whether you're a professional or not. Wouldn't it be useful to have the skills to communicate effectively, powerfully, emotionally with your audience? Because if you think about it, until we get the attention of an audience, we can't convince them to do anything. So this book talks about the process, the techniques of visual persuasion, and how you can use them in day-to-day -day communication to improve your business, and to make your ideas more impactful, and to, to understand how you are being manipulated by the people that create visual images themselves. It's cool. Well, we'll it's so, it's and, so uh, cool. Yeah. We'll have to get a copy, do a review, and then we'll put a, hopefully a link in the uh, uh, in the description wherever you're watching this as to where you can go to find it. So finally, we can get a copy let you go, for your review. We can get a copy for your review in nanoseconds. Not a problem. Yeah, I think, I, I think also, Larry, we, we're going to do another separate show to cover the book um, fully, so people can hopefully find out a few secrets. Not too many, I'm sure, but a few secrets of uh, of what you're discussing in it. I would love to have that. That would be a fun interview to have. Cool. So finally, before we let you go, since we're in an industry about people and relationships, we have been asking all of our guests to tell us something about themselves that we, or maybe even your many viewers, fans and followers, don't already know about you. What do you do when you stop editing? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to ask myself to answer that question for the last more years than I care to count. <laughs> my, my family has a running bet that I will never retire because I don't know how to not work. Uh, this is a big flaw, Fair I'm enough. afraid, but I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week because I love it. I, I mean, I love, I love three things. I love helping people. I love teaching people and I love learning new subjects. And how can you give that up? I mean, how can you, how can I how yeah. can I not get excited about waking up in the morning when I know that there's gonna be people that have problems that I can help because I've got the skills to do it? There's new software to learn that I can tackle. Uh, it, it's just how can you retire yeah. from that? Sounds great. Yeah. We look forward to many more years. We do indeed. Uh, it's, well, it's always but... it's always fascinating and inspirational listening to you, Larry. So thank you very much indeed for your for getting up early, I think as well, maybe uh, to come on the show today. Um, to oh, see all of our pleasure. videos and kit reviews, then you can head over to Kit Plus TV, which is brought to you with the support of Media Proxy, and you can find out more about them at mediaproxy.com. Thank you for watching today. Thank you. What a lovely interview. Thank you.